So, good morning, colleagues, and a very, very warm welcome to our speaker, Mr. Neil McLeod, this morning. Today, we're going to hear a little story about uh, Cinderella, but a different Cinderella story that uh, we have been used to. And so, uh, Neil, we're really, really looking forward to your talk entitled Sanitation, the Cinderella in the Climate Change and Human Sustainability Debate. Uh, I believe from the little blurb that you sent us uh, that while we all understand sanitation in, to include sewage treatment and solid waste disposal, uh, sanitation has many valuable uh, aspects to it as well. You are going to talk about how that involves plant nutrients, uh, water and energy and other essential commodities and tell us a little bit more about the topic which many of us are a little bit inert to or need to be educated. So we're really looking forward to listening to your presentation. But before I get ahead of myself, Neil McLeod has been working as a civil engineer, uh, specializing in the provision of water and sanitation services for over 50 years. So you can see why he is a very special guest today to enlighten us on this topic. He is currently a fellow of the South African Academy of Engineering and the SAAE uh, is hosted by ASAF. And um, when we met earlier in the year uh, with uh, Professor Elsabi Kearsley, who is the current uh, president of the Engineering Academy together with Mr. Neil McLeod and Bob Poulin, uh, we realized that although we host each other and we live under the same infrastructure, we have very little that we do together. So this uh, joint uh, initiative is meant to, to, to show peace, the kind of uh, exclusivity that the engineering fraternity brings to the country as a whole. Uh, the Engineering Academy kind of was launched in March of 1997 and has over 150 odd uh, fellows and uh, maintains a lot of linkage with academic uh, academies of engineering in other countries and is a member of the Council of Academies of Engineering and Technological Sciences. So, so Neil, we're very proud of what you have done. I see from... Uh, the little um, uh, piece that we have about you is that you are an honorary fellow of the South African Institution of Civil Engineering and served as the president in 2007, uh, 2007 and also an honorary fellow of the Institute of Municipal Engineering of Southern Africa. And of course, I've mentioned uh, the fellow of the Southern, the Southern, the South African Academy Engineering of engineering and also a fellow of the International Water Association. So your reputation precedes you. And um, given that you are aptly positioned in, uh, in, in KwaZulu-Natal, uh, where we've recently had floods and all kinds of other issues, we really, really look forward to hearing um, your little Cinderella story and showing us how um, sanitation is kind of juxtaposed with climate change and other sustainability issues. So with that meal, I, I wish to welcome you and uh, engage with you um, for the first part of the conversation, which is your presentation. And then we'll have a discussion and invite um, uh, participants to ask their questions and to join us as we go along. So go ahead, over to you. Thanks very much. So the first technology challenge I have to overcome is to share the screen. Right. No, I just can't get it to share the screen. We can see your screen. Just put it into yeah, presentation, man. Yeah. 
I just, Almost. Need, to, I just need to get this thing out of the way. Sorry, for some reason, it worked perfectly the first time. I think you can just click on resume slideshow or on the icon right at the um, top. Would it not work if you click on resume slideshow? There we go. There Thank we you. go. Perfect. Right. Sorry about that. Um, so you may think there's a bit of hyperbole in this title that I gave to our discussion. Um, maybe the Cinderella brings it down to earth. But I do believe what I'm going to talk to you about today does have an impact on the human sustainability and the future of humankind, in fact. And maybe at the end of today, when you flush the toilet, you will uh, think about these esoteric uh, issues. So why is hesitation relevant to the title of this, of this talk? Um, I don't need to tell you that climate change not only affects the weather, but then indirectly has an impact on how we manage water, energy, agriculture, and even the environment, particularly when it comes to biodiversity. And sanitation, as I hope you will hear today, actually has an ability to impact positively on all of those different aspects. And since the Bonn Conference in 2011, um, the world started to realize, certainly in the engineering and science sectors, that there's a link or a connectivity between water, energy, and food, and within water is sanitation. So there's the water energy food nexus. And then about five or six years later, the Toilet Board Coalition, which is based in Geneva and was started by Unilever and Kimberly Clark and others, a private sector initiative, realized that there was a need to do something about sanitation. And they gave birth to this concept of a sustainable sanitation circular economy. So I'll show you one of their slides later on about their circular economy thinking and how it impacts on, on what I have to say. But then there are other challenges that uh, also impact on this topic. The first thing is that, well, look what's happened with uh, the Ukraine and Russia. Suddenly coal and the price of coal has become astronomical. Potable water is going to change in time as the population changes, as climate change impacts and as the levels of pollution continue to rise. So the sources of, of fresh water and the quality thereof is reducing dramatically. And then we're running out of plant nutrients. And I'll talk quite a lot about that later on. And the way we collect sewage and process it and dispose of it is not sustainable. For number one, we don't have enough water to actually um, flush the toilet. Number two, we can't afford the kind of infrastructure that we need to carry it. I remember doing an exercise in about 2010 when we were providing off-grid sanitation to communities. And I was asked, what would it cost to provide traditional pipe sanitation? 250,000 families at that time were benefiting from off-grid solutions and to connect them up with the sewage and water pipes and everything was going to cost six and a half billion rand just for Etiwin enormous cost. And so we quickly realized that we needed to think differently. And from the political aspects, society is being conditioned to viewing a flushing toilet as a rat almost. Uh, though I must give credit to the previous minister, who was the first minister to say that it's not about flushing and we have to change the paradigm. But to change the paradigm, we need a solution that is acceptable to the communities that we provide these services to. And equally centralized sewage treatment works are still preferred. Don't dispose of any sewage near me, the NIMBY concept. Send it somewhere far away so that it can just vanish. Flush and forget is the saying that you hear so often. And on the solid waste side, um, you just have to look around and look at the Durban beaches and the rivers in Durban after the recent uh, flood disaster to see how much plastic is actually being left in the environment because that aspect of sanitation is not being carefully managed. And in fact, a lot of the waste, the solid waste, ends up in the sewage systems and has to be screened out at the head of the works and blocks the drains and causes sewage overflows and other things. So we are degrading the environment because 
these two services are not functioning as they should. UN Water, I saw this figure, and I'll show you a graph. 56% of domestic wastewater is safely treated. If you add in the commercial industrial waste, that figure plummets from what I can see to something like 30% or even 20%, depending on who you believe. And the UN Environment Programme says that 11 million tons of plastic go into our oceans every year. And I'm sure you've seen these horrific pictures of turtles with plastic bags around their heads and fish with plastic on their tails. Um, there's plastic everywhere. There are even plastic islands in the middle of the ocean in certain places these days. And if you want to see it in a picture, all the red countries, and I would guess most of the gray ones, because there there's no data, treat less than 50% of their sewage. Only the green ones treat more than 75% of their domestic sewage. And in, I say most of the gray ones are red because some of these gray countries I've worked in, like take uh, the, the country next to India there, Pakistan. I had an occasion to work with Karachi because they are realizing that although the Indus River flows are rising, as the Himalayas or Himalayas, as they call it, glaciers melt, after 2050, there won't be many glaciers left and the Indus River faces a 50 to 60% drop in river flow. And Karachi depends on the Indus River for its water supply. So the question was, what do we do when the Indus River runs dry, besides go to war with India, I guess. And I then learned that only 10% of their sewage is actually treated, which means that all the water that's used to flush and wash goes straight into the Bay of Bengal, which is basically an, an underwater desert. So they're not collecting the water and treating it to be able to recycle it and equally the prospect of desalination of the seawater is uh, a distant future thought. And if you want to look at the, at the water side, water scarcity is measured by the number of litres per person or cubic metres per person that's available in the rivers in the country. And water is either unavailable or scarce because people can't afford the cost of the investments and the cost of the water, or which is the dark blue areas, mainly in Africa and parts of Asia. Or it's because there just isn't enough runoff in the rivers to sustain um, the demands of the people to the level that is considered satisfactory. So you'll see even South Africa, there's pale blue and parts of it already dark blue, um, you know, darker blue, which means that we are a water scarce country, less than a thousand cubic meters per person per year in runoff. And that is ironic because we then use water to flush our toilets. Um, the question is, is that sustainable into the future? And we're talking about how do we use water? So let's go from the macro to the micro. The toilets that we use today, the flushing toilets, are almost identical to the ones that were developed in the Victorian era. Those toilets, the difference is they used something like 25 litres to flush and they had cast iron interiors, whereas today we have 9 litre flushes and uh, plastic interiors. And the Water Research Commission in South Africa has calculated that 30% of the water that we use in our houses goes to flushing the toilet. So we take beautiful water, we purify it, we convey it all the way to our house, maintain the pressure, and then take a third of that in-house water and flush it down the toilet. Now that, that is actually even more ironic because there's, there's the early toilets from Queen Victoria's time. They weren't close coupled, but they were quite beautiful. And you can see the huge system that was needed to flush because they hadn't worked out how to make them efficient. But the irony for me is that if you, if you know how a toilet works, when you flush, that nine liters runs out of the toilet and while it's running out, another one liter runs in, so 10 liters per flush. To remove the waste that we produce, human excrement, which is about one liter per person per day. And if you go to the toilet four times a day and you use 10 liters per flush, that's 40 liters to which you add one liter of impurity and then you send 41 liters all the way to a sewage box and need an infrastructure and a network to carry that. And all that flush does is it washes the toilet and it transports the excrement in the water about half a meter through the wall where it drops down vertically into the sewer and gets run, carried away by the bath water and the kitchen wastewater. That cannot be efficient as we move towards water scarcity. 
if I move on, this is the world's population. You can see how rapidly it's grown since the start of the last uh, century. And we're close to 8 billion. I think the last time I looked, the population of the world is now about 7.9 billion. And coupled with that is urbanization. In about 2007, the number of people in urban areas exceeded the number of people living in rural areas, which is a trend that is certainly seeming to be accelerating. And if you look at how we feed those people, this is a graph showing the amount of arable land that's available. And you can see it's plateaued. This graph goes to 2007, but it's carried on. Um, I saw one the other day that took it to 2015 and much the same picture is, is showing. Now people will speculate about why it is flattened, whether it's because of more efficient agricultural practices or whether it's because of urbanization that I just mentioned in the previous slide, which is encroaching into the previous farmland. There's certainly true around where I live. Um, or it's because of poor farming practices that have resulted in salt lock and the rest of it, which makes once arable land no longer arable. And if you factor that into the population, the amount of arable land per person is halved in 50 years between 1960 and 2010. And again, this is from the FAO, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, this slide in the previous one, that downward trend is continuing. So now we have to feed more people on less land. And how do we do that? We use fertilizer. And a vital component of fertilizer is phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, I was amazed to learn from a doctor and from others that phosphorus is a critical building block of, of our DNA and animals DNA and it's used to process um, the food and whatever else into to metabolize the cellular energy and it's limited in its sources you'll see Russia's there now Russia's just been sanctioned so the phosphorus or phosphate rock from Russia suddenly is taken out of the market and that drives the price up and drives the price of food up and makes food unaffordable to millions of people. But it gets worse because the quality of the rock as it starts to diminish from the prospecting that's been done shows that the deeper you go into these reserves under the ground, you start to get increased levels of pollution with heavy metals and radioactive materials. And what do we do with the food that we eat? Well, 80% of the nitrogen and 50% of the phosphorus that is in our wastewater is in the urine. And that all ends up in the bottom of the ocean. This is work done by Dana Cordell, which shows that she predicted that phosphorus will peak around about 2025, three years time. And if you don't believe an individual researcher, here's the FAO's version. And they reckon around about 2030 phosphorus peaks. And if you look at the solid colored sections compared to the pale blue line, you will see that around about 2050, demand exceeds supply. Sorry about that, something just fell on the floor. So we are heading for an uncertain future when it comes to phosphorus, which we need to grow the crops and feed the world. And all we are doing is sending it to the bottom of the ocean, where it is extremely difficult to recover. So people start thinking, here's the Toilet Board Coalition's thinking of the circular economy for sanitation. There's one relating to toilets. How do we build better toilets, more water efficient toilets, toilets that can help us to separate out the valuable commodities from the non-valuable. And what about the processing technology once you've collected the waste at the toilet? And what about using smart technology to optimize the way that we provide sanitation services? And the World Bank has also recently produced this concept, again, circular economy thinking. How do we return those valuable resources into the economy so that we don't just use and dispose, so that we can ensure that we do have a sustainable future? But of course, if we haven't managed to solve this problem since 1860, um, you can imagine that it is what some of the younger people call a wicked problem. Um, and there are these impediments. Sanitation is a Cinderella. It's, you know, it's this thing that's in the back, overlooked, unloved, that has the potential to be the bell of the ball and ride in the gold carriage and be something that contributes to the future sustainability of the world. 
The other thing is that we are conditioned as people to avoid sanitation. It's seen as something dangerous to our health, something to get as far away from us as possible. When in fact, it can be returned to a, the sewage can be returned to a usable commodity, just through chemistry and science. And the irony for me is that most of the rivers that we take water from today, be it in Gauteng or Durban or Cape Town, are fairly heavily polluted with sewage anyway. And we treat that using traditional methods very effectively and produce a water that meets the world health standards. But you see, it's out of sight. I remember once I was told by a politician when I wanted to do direct use, we do have one plant in Durban, just put it into the river and take it out a kilometer downstream. And my reply was, well, we sample the river upstream and downstream of our sewage disposal point, the treated effluent, and we improve the river water quality. So I put something in that's cleaner in the river to take it out further down. Why can't we just do it directly? And now Cape Town, uh, and I saw Peter Flowers on here, those far thinking people in Cape Town have started to do direct treatments where they're able to treat their sewage satisfactory and return it into the flow. The other thing is we don't still have standards. We don't have ways of testing. And that's a big failure of the system. They are being developed, but we need them. And we also need to have solutions that are financially sustainable. And then the other thing is how do we actually get people to understand what we're trying to do and how do we increase innovation to produce the products that we need to have toilets that use close to zero flush volume and that can recover the nutrients and the energy at source, what I call my washing machine outside the back of every house. And how do we make it smaller? Because at the moment, the technologies are such that you need a 20 foot container to fit them in. In 2010, things changed when this man came to Durban to ask us, what are you doing about sanitation? Why are you encouraging us to invest in sanitation? And so Gates put in a lot of money and started this concept of the reinvent the toilet challenge. And out of that have come the first early products. This is now a Laufen toilet. Um, it involved complex um, finite element analysis to, to design it. I, it's what you call the teapot concept. If you pour water out of a teapot fast, it doesn't cling to the surface. If you pour it out slowly, it adheres to the surface and dribbles down the side. This toilet uses that concept without having to have dam walls inside and all the rest of it to separate the urine from the flushing and the feces. The trouble is that toilet costs 21,000 Rand in South Africa. But we are in the process of sourcing locally made um, repeats of this EOS technology. EOS is a Swiss research institute to make them at an affordable cost to be used so that we can effectively separate the urine where the 80% and the 50% of the nutrients are to recycle. Here's a miniaturized one, still far too complicated, um, but we're hitting, that's a big change from a 20 foot container. But in the end, the idea is to be able to recover the phosphorus and the nitrogen, and all that you would have is gray water, no solids, which then means that the sewer system can be much smaller and more efficient, and we can reduce the cost of networks, and all that will get to the sewage works is COD and no nutrients. So sewage treatment plants will become far more energy efficient and far less complicated. It's like a cell phone thinking for sanitation. I used to keep two of these bottles on my table. This is phosphorus recovered from urine. You cannot tell the difference from that with that white powder from rock phosphorus. And that's what the current technologies enable us to do. It can be very complicated using solar. He has Gates looking at one of his team's uh, really way out inventions, obviously no suitable for, for poor communities. But this was the early thinking around about 2011, 2012. There is a lot going on. I'll just show you some slides from Durban. This is a, a plant that can process 35 tons a day of human waste using black soldier flower larvae, which you can grow and harvest them and recover the lipids and the proteins and use those in animal feed and as sources of useful oils and things. And these bugs process the fecal waste um, in, in a safe way. Or you can use this plant, which we also developed called the Ladepa, where we process fecal sludge and produce pathogen-free pellets, which make wonderful fertilizer. The cabbages grown in this stuff are double the size of cabbages grown 
in traditional fertilizers, and we think it's because of the carbon that's in, in these pellets. Or you can build algal raceways and grow the same algae that make oil. This is in Kingsbury and Durban, and harvest the algae and cut it and produce a biodiesel from your partially treated sewage effluent. Or you can get really scientific and here you can see a nitrifier and a, it's the column in the middle to the left of the orange box. And you can see a struvite recovery for the phosphorus and then you can see a dehydrating unit, the orange box. And in fact, in our basement, where I used to work, we thought we'd better show the world. These are people all from Yevach in Switzerland. They came to see the plant. Here we take this, the urine from the staff in the building and on the left, is the nitrifying tower and on the in the middle and the column to the left of it is where the phosphorus is recovered. So we know it can be done. So I guess to end, next time you flush the toilet, just think about the future sustainability. Think where those valuable resources are going. And maybe you'd like to be part of the solution to help us use science and engineering to produce solutions across the value chain that enable us to recover these vital elements and ensure that we continue to sustain plant growth and our existence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. I mean, that was an incredible insight into the kind of cascade of activities that are required in the purification. Now, given that we, we have this knowledge how or how not are we applying this in our day-to-day -day activities of water purification? Well, you see, the problem with engineers is that we're terrible communicators. And that, that is part of the problem that we have. We, we haven't been able to, to get this message out to people effectively. And right now, until we can solve the technology aspects. We don't have something to offer people that's as good as a flushing toilet. That EOS toilet still uses 0.6 of a liter to flush. And that's a vast improvement from the nine liters. So that's step one. And we, and we won't make them for 21,000 rand. We'll make them for 400 rand. That's, that's what we want to get to. So right. now for the first time, we've got an interface, but the rest is still the same and that's, still being worked on with funding by Gates and Water Research and UKZN and others. So, so we, now we're like in between. We know where we want to get to, we know where we are. Uh, so we can't push the message too hard because then people say, well, I want one, but, but where is it? And we can't. Offer right. It. Right. I mean, but before we even move into this high technology, I mean, our access of water as a basic commodity in, in major parts of our country is still lacking. And it's been exacerbated now, particularly in KwaZulu-Natal with the recent droughts. I mean, this morning on the radio, they were talking about um, how bad the water situation is in the Ugo district in the Southern uh, KwaZulu-Natal region. Uh, and I mean, we, we hear these stories on a day-to-day -day basis. So, so Surely our government makes utility of access to information of the likes of yourselves and other researchers in their planning. So while I, I, I understand that you say that, you know, it is necessary to get the message across, but um, infrastructure development, et cetera, is part and parcel of uh, governance of the state. Uh, and so, so, in addition to bringing in this new technology to be able to um, purify systems a little bit better, but then just having access to this clean water seems to be a problem. How do we mitigate against that? Yeah, very all right. I'm getting an echo. Um, so, you know, look at, look at, uh, at Port Elizabeth, Kaveja. It runs out of water in half that city next month. That's how serious it is. Yep. And there's a number of issues here. Firstly, the cost of providing the infrastructure for water is actually quite low per person because you can put in very small pipes and you can get people enough water to live. Whereas sanitation, as I said in my talk, is very expensive to provide a pipe. Yeah. 
and you've got this mis- mixed match between the political message and what is feasible. You have mm-hmm. you're up to a flushing toilet, but then you know your your water consumption is going to go up by thirty percent, and can you afford to pay for that? And mm-hmm. so there's this affordability. We've got a lot of poor people and not a lot of money to provide the services, and we're not right. moving away from the way we've done it for the last two hundred years. So we need to change our thinking, move to a, a different approach, distributed stories. There's lots of things we've tried in Durban. Rather than having one reservoir and having big pipes that have to carry all the peak flows, right. put a tank in every house, and then you only have to carry the average flow, and the tank goes up and down as you use your water. That kind of thinking has been tried, but then you get the politicians saying, no, no, you must be able to just open a tap and it must come out under full pressure. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. and that's the that's the problem I faced in my, in my working days, is, is is what being promised is what every house in, in Santon or Lucia and Durban or Constantia has got. That's what you're entitled to but, and what right. we can afford. And the old ministers used to talk about a ladder concept. Let's get you some water to your, to your house and get you some kind of toilet that doesn't flush and will over time get on. But all the people says, well, we know that's a trick because you're never going to go to step two up the ladder. We're going to be left with this if we agree to it. So it's all about the messaging and and, uh, and and getting people to, my my message to Gates was, I want the toilet that we're providing to poor people to be the same toilet as in your house. Then there's no discrimination. And the EOS right. toilet from the customer facing side is the first thing. If everybody had a urine diverting EOS type toilet with a very low flush or ultimately a, a no flush, now we have a solution that cuts the water consumption, given that we're water scarce, that reduces the flows, it reduces the level of pollution. It all flows right. on. But that toilet right. was only produced last year. So you know, we, now we've got to market it and, and say, we now have a solution. And right. everyone can think about converting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we have a question on the chat. I'll go through it. But I encourage uh, colleagues who are on the webinar, if you have any questions or comments, please put it in the Q&A or if you uh, put a show of hands, uh, my colleague Renata will help uh, open up uh, the system so that you could ask your question in person. There's a question here that says, is there any work being done on the collection and reuse of the nutrients once they have been isolated from a building of toilets? That's from Zanta Ru. In South Africa? It's not being done. Um, but some countries like Japan are leading the way in terms of recovering the phosphorus. But in our country, we've got the technology to do it. And there are companies that are interested in buying the phosphorus, but because it's not coming out at the volumes that are needed at the moment, uh, the market is not big enough to warrant people um, looking at it. And because, as I said earlier, there are not product standards, all the big chains and people won't touch the product yet because they say if it gets out that this plant was grown using phosphorus from a human excreta, mm-hmm. they're not going to buy it. And so we yeah. need the standards and we need the messaging to overcome that that fear or that suspicion that that it may affect their health. But that that's going to be the reality in the future. You know, Kharteng and all those inland regions when those rivers can't meet the need, the only source of water you're going to have is uh, reused effluent. So we have to right. get the units in place. And when the phosphorus rock runs out or can't meet the demand and is that gap after 2050 or whenever it is, we're going to have to start recovering the phosphorus. I've mm-hmm. seen that in crises around here, just up the coast from me in, in Caesar Water, when there was yeah. a, a drought. They introduced a recycling plant and the people agreed to it immediately. We'd rather have that water than no water. So we need a, mm. what Winston Churchill said, never let a crisis go to waste. So we need a few more crises to push as is the case with Cape Town, that you right. um, to use these things which until now have been terrible. Then you use it and you find it's fine. Right. So we, need, right. we need some more, what, what do you call it, reference sites to take people to and say, look, they're using it, they, they're fine. And this is your future reality. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a question, what options are there for sanitation in informal settlements? Okay, so that's a function of density. Um, and there, there are two issues here. In an informal settlement, as we've 
been reminded yet again in the last few weeks, there's the drainage aspect and there's the sewage aspect. So there's the black water, gray water, and there's the, the rainwater. So because of the densities, you need some kind of small bore pipe system to mm -hmm. carry the sewage away. At the moment, if it's too dense, you can't put a toilet at each house because when you need an area for the water because you can't put pipes in. You need an area for the water to be evapotranspirated by sunlight. In our geology here, you need about 400 square meters of ground to evaporate the amount of water that's used per day. And shacks don't have 400 square meters of ground around them exposed to the sun. So you, you, all you end up doing is putting your pollution into the neighbor's um, informal house. So we've used con chipping containers, which we've converted into toilets and ablution facilities where you, within 75 meters, can access. But, you know, as a woman going out at night to the toilet, you never do that. You'll use a, a bucket or something and then go dispose of it. So it's not optimum. So we need some kind of small bore pipe system, but then that means that the planning needs to be formalized and there needs to be a close relationship between planning and, and providing of services. And we're struggling mm -hmm. to get that right, to, to lay out these informal areas and formalize them, as people would say, to create spaces for pipe. And then yeah. there are other, there's lots of technology, like DWATs, you know, mini, mm -hmm. mini Take yeah, uh, there's there's a kind of a comment in the chat, uh, and it relates to uh, active advocacy. Uh, what can scholars do to promote advocacy uh, for politicians to make the right decisions or the decision makers to heed the signs and 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 the the, the challenges that you spoke about. Uh, and the kind of mitigating uh, options that you have provided in your presentation. Yeah, so I watched the debate about vaccinations and COVID with interest, because that's a parallel thing, where the experts yeah. are saying one thing, and some people believe and some don't, and some politicians believe and some don't. And some of the advice is ignored and some is not ignored, selectively. And we've got that exact thing here with this, concept of the Cinderella. Some people see it as this ugly, you know, sort of forgotten uh, person in the kitchen and others yeah. see, see the princess in the carriage. And, and if the engineers keep pushing the message, well, it becomes a bit of a, oh, not you again. So the more yeah. diverse a sector, if the researchers and the scientists can also say, yes, it is possible to make you safe and yes, it mm. is necessary to ensure our future and oh, phosphorus running out. We never thought about that. Have you realized that? And it, it's not like the climate change debate where you can't see something. You can see this resource is diminishing. So it's going to yeah. run out. And when it's gone, what are you going to do? How are you going to grow yeah. your crops? So yes, we need the agricultural people and the, the and the, the people and you know, the biology people to actually start also raising their voice. And the more channels that are pushing this message out, I think the more it will be believed rather than just some engineer trying to do up some mm -hmm. new fancy technology. Yeah. Um, David Benjamin Borta says, possibly start with upper market uh, developments first and make it compulsory. That is probably to the, uh, um, the, the newer technology you are making reference to. Uh, Julia Taylor says, thanks for the really interesting presentation. What could WITS test out on campus to model sustainable sanitation? So we are trying to get more cities and more universities involved in the field testing and not just have it happening in Etigui. I know Cape Town with Cape Town University showed interest. Um, if you want to, me to hook you up with Gates, because I know they would like more people doing the testing and, and, and researching. I can do that because the more, more brains we can get on this topic, I think the quicker we're going to solve the problem. So um, maybe through um, Professor Suryal, you can get my address or Renata Pena and I can hook you up with Gates um, so that so you can put your hand up as well. I know they, the Gates people were in Cape Town last week uh, talking to them. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, mm -hmm. the more the merrier. It's this whole thing. The more people we can get pushing this message out from different angles, 
the better. And particularly not just engineers, agriculturists, scientists, yeah. Yeah, um, about doing research, and, okay, that's a response to a previous comment. Uh, Neil, please explain to us, or at least to me, uh, the process of uh, water purification. We utilize fresh water predominantly for our water usage. Whereas, uh, for example, in, in um, Saudi, they have uh, started to moot uh, desalination and to get their cost to under 30 cents, you know, per kiloliter or whatever the denomination is. And they've met that target. Um, why is it that we do not um, go the route of uh, utilizing the, the, the sea as a source for our water needs? So there are a number of factors. Our oceans are wild. I mean, off Saudi, you know, you don't have six, 10 meter waves a time. So we have a very aggressive ocean. And the cost of the intakes, where you have to actually tunnel under the seabed and then get to a place where you don't have the sediment being stirred up by the wave action. Now you can have to go out a kilometer or so under the sea. Those tunnels are extremely expensive. Or if you lay a pipe on the surface, you have to anchor it to the seabed. Otherwise, the waves will just, you know, kick it around like a dog's tail. Mm -hmm. So the, there's a very big cost there. And there's a sweet spot. If you, if you build a plant less than 120 megaliters a day, it's not the, the, the cost. The small plants are very expensive per cubic meter. And then they come down mm -hmm. to around about 100 to 150. And then they go up again as you have to build bigger tunnels. So the first thing is the size of the plant you need to build. Um, the second thing is that our, our terrain compared to Saudi and some of these desert countries is very different. We, to lift the water from the sea up to Gauteng and lay that pipeline and pump that water will mm -hmm. be massively expensive. So although they may be treated, that's 30 American cents, right? So that's five rand a kilometer, which is about the same price as, as the water in a dam in South Africa. The, the prices we, I've seen for, for, for this part of the world range between 20 rand and 60 rand a kiloliter just for the diesel um, mm -hmm. so you've yeah. got that and then you've got the fact that we don't have electricity and they're very intensive use of electricity for the for the removal of forcing at a molecular level the salt water through those membranes so that you retain only the water molecules and get the rest out it requires a lot of energy mm -hmm. never mind that it's at the sea level now you're going to lift it up into the hinterland so the cost of desalination is extremely expensive and really only viable in the coastal, the coastal areas or where mm -hmm. they don't have so, such a lot of head to have to, to lift. So yeah, it's a, in fact, it's easier and low, lower cost to recycle sewage. There's less impurities in sewage than there is in sewage. Mm -hmm. So, but you've got the yuck factor. Oh, you know, this, this went through a person. Joburg's water has been through seven stomachs before they drink it. They just don't know it. You know, you, it goes into into liquor Standerton and it comes out. It goes into the next one and it comes out. When I was lost in Standerton, they were producing nine million liters of sewage a day and sticking straight into the Royal River. And it goes down yeah. to where you are in, in Joburg and you drink it and it's safe. Yeah. Nobody gets sick and dies. Right. You don't see it happening. So right. yeah, you know, it's it's all it's all in here. Right, yeah. right. I mean, if you if if you think about the astronauts who work on the space. Yes. Um, uh, whatever networks, uh, they don't carry water with them. That's all recycled water, right? Exactly. Exactly. So, 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 so I mean, if there were uh, uh, problems with it, I mean, they would not have sustained yes. such projects of long-term yes. presence uh, on the space things. Yeah, the um, dehumidifying the air, taking the sweat out of the air, taking yeah. the water out of the excrement, you know, and and as you say. They've been like that for years. There's right. lots of places where recycling is taking place, reuse, and people are fine. There's no, I mean, Wintook in in in, uh, in Namibia, they their water supply is recycled sewage, ninety percent, with a little top yeah. up from the few rivers that they've got. They, they've right. been like this since the 1980s, no problem. Yeah, yeah. I I was particularly intrigued by uh, the slide you showed. Uh, with respect to uh, water scarcity in Africa. 
that uh, pale blue uh, parts in the map where, you know, it's uh, the utility is less than uh, 1,000 cubic centimeter per person mm -hmm. per year or something like that. Cubic meters, yeah. Yeah, cubic meters. Now, uh, why why is this such a threat in Africa? Whenever you look at weather, <laughs> weather programs across Africa, we always seem to have, you know, that tropical belt of uh, very heavy rains, with the exception of the Sahara to the north of that and in southern Africa in the drought-stricken areas. So what's happening with all this water in terms so, of contributing to these uh, data? Yes, yeah, so the dark blue, which is the whole central band of Africa, is economic scarcity. So they've got lots of water relative to the number of people. Mm -hmm. but they don't have the economy and the finances to, to build the infrastructure to carry that water ah, okay. at, an, at an affordable price. So you've got poor people um, and expensive infrastructure that doesn't exist. So mm -hmm. if you're going to build something, then the people can't afford to pay for it because it's just too expensive and the government can't afford to subsidize it. And then you get the top and the bottom where it is affordable. But now, yeah, I mean, South Africa's average rainfall is under 500 millimeters a year. The, the, the world average is close to 900. So we are less than half the world average. So we, and remember the 60% of the rain falls in two provinces, KwaZulu-Natal and the Eastern Province. We get 60% of the country's rain and we 16% of the surface area. You move past the Drakensberg Mountains, you move into a desert, basically. So that's that's another conundrum that South Africa faces. If you live on the East Coast, you're fine. You move across the mountain, you, you, there's some children, I'm told, in the far west of our country that don't see rain until they go to school. Yeah, yeah. There are years yeah. of no rain. There are a few more questions uh, cropping up on the Q&A. Uh, Marky Mayers asks, as solar becomes the new norm for all citizens to deal with electricity matters, how can a normal household simply convert on their own cost to alternate solution for our toilets? Uh, my answer would be not yet. Unless, not yet. You can, unless you can have got a lot of money and you can find space for a 20-foot container, which mm -hmm. is because we've got to miniaturize what we've developed over the last 10 years down now into what fits in the washing machine. But I would say in another two to five years, because it's really moving fast now. In fact, I was told last week that I think it's Samsung has come in to help miniaturize it, that those, the first mini plants will soon be available for, as prototypes. Mm -hmm. um, wow. but you're right. So then you have a solar collector on the top, a dish that focuses the energy which enables you to dehydrate and you can then start processing. But your problem is going to be there isn't yet a fully grown market and a, and a logistics platform to collect the phosphorus from you. But mm -hmm. as the price goes up, um, that phosphorus is going to be, I would say in, a, in 20 years time, more cost valuable than gold because people will be falling over to get to it and there'll be a whole industry, second industry, in collecting that phosphorus and your nitrified urine to use as fertilizer. So, yeah, it's... It's, we're at the start of the new future when it comes to sanitation. But right now, other than buying a, a, a EOS South African equivalent toilet and cutting your water worth about 30% in-house, um, yeah, that's, I would, I would think, you know, in this country, we legislated about 30 years ago to ban those automatic flushing urinals. For the men, they'll know what I'm talking about, where you had that tank that flushed day and night. It fills up when it got to the top, it tipped a, a, a float and it flushed. And it flushed day and night, weekends, never. Then we outlawed them. And the, the uh, property managers were very upset with us for legislating that until they got their next water bill and said, why didn't you force us to do this before? Our water bill has gone down by half. Now, we will have to legislate in the future once these toilets are freely available that you may only build new properties with urine separating low flush toilets and mm -hmm. that will be a huge impact straight away but right now we can't legislate because they're not affordable generally and they're not, they don't look as beautiful as as ceramic toilets because the ones we're making for 400 rand are are a hard plastic uh, manufacturer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so you actually took care of uh, david uh, benjamin Botter's question as well about the uh 
treatment uh, to take out phosphorus from conventional treatment plants. Um, there's another one by Xanta Ru. In your opinion, do you ever think that the dry systems would be accepted as a viable sanitation solution, uh, even if there were urban collection systems in place? So do you think that the dry systems could work? So that is, that is the sort of utopia. That's where we would like to get to. And the Gates people have done research into surface texturing, um, sort of at a nanoparticle level, where you can build a surface that actually rejects urine and feces. So it just slides off and, and would disappear. Um, and, and have a way of producing a, a seal that stops the odor from coming back into the house. But those technologies are, are untested in terms of lifespan. Uh, there's also a spray you can spray on the surface that will create that same slip effect. So I think ultra low flush, less than half a liter is going to be the way to go for now, which then reduces the burden on having to evaporate the wood out to recover the nutrients when you go into the washing machine outside. I call it a washing machine because it's a processing box. <laughs> so yes, so because it looks, it hopefully will look like a white washing machine. Right, white right. is clean, you know. So yeah, it's, it's, it's where we want to get to, but I think realistically we hit, we're realizing that for now, low flush. You still need a sewer, remember, to carry your bath water and your kitchen wastewater away. But at the moment, it's a 100 millimeter pipe. What we are hoping to do is cut that down to a 50 millimeter pipe, which then means that the sewers in the street can also be small bore because you're just carrying a liquid. Um, and that reduces the network cost, which means more people can mm -hmm, access mm -hmm. water and sewage. And it reduces the sewage treatment cost, as I said, because you've taken the nutrients out of source and the solids. So yeah, that, that's, that's where we want to get to. And that's yeah. how we would achieve a sustainable future. Yeah. Neil, just please give us a little bit food for thought on the nexus between water, energy, and food. Um, I mean, you mentioned that in your introduction, but essentially, I mean, these are the sorts of issues that speak to our uh, sustainable development uh, objectives. Yes. Uh, so, so, I mean... I can imagine in my mind the way, in, and, and your slide kind of spoke to it. Uh, but how do we, how do we as a society, uh, pay a little bit more, you know, focus to this water, energy, food nexus? Well, I think for people to get to get on board, they've got to understand what it is. I mean, I find people that don't even know what the word nexus means. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, understanding that those three things, some have a one-to-one -one connection and some have a, have a you know, reverse connection. So water is needed to make hydropower, it's needed to grow crops, mm -hmm. it's needed to generate steam so that steam turbines can work if, you, if you're not moving to solar. So water affects all of them. Food, of course, needs water and it, right. to grow the crops and it needs energy for the, for the plant that the harvesting and all the rest of it and it needs people to do the work who need water and energy to survive so that's and, and then yeah so that they all kind of cross link and need each other mm -hmm. and i think you've tended to work in silos and say well i'm just providing water and i'm just providing energy and i'm just providing food where in fact if we can if we can realize the interconnectivity and say well if the crops can be more efficient and use less water then there's more water available for people. And if the energy people can get off needing water to generate and go to solar, that also reduces the water demand, which then helps us being a water scarce country because if we're using less water, it means more people can survive. So th there's this whole sustainability thing running in the Nexus debate, as there is right. in the economy. And I mean, the slide you also showed about uh, the decrease in the irritable land. Yes. for growing crops. I mean, that's also very important. What about these alternate means of uh, producing, you know, agro, what, uh, what's the I term? Uh, yeah, for food yes. produ production. Yeah, so there are, but the scale at which we need to feed the growing population, mm -hmm. I don't see hydroponics being a medium to... The way the solution, yeah. And it's very expensive compared to plowing land and and growing crops using the sun because now you've you know, it's kind of an artificial process and mm -hmm. it needs a lot of water 
and we don't have a lot of water in this country. So right. you know, we need to improve the efficiency of irrigation even more and, and have crops that need, that can withstand the heat that's coming. I mean, I was reading horrific stories about India recently and how you know, animals are dying and people are dying of heat stroke because they're seeing temperatures like 50 degrees. I mean, I can't believe it. Now, mm -hmm. if we don't have crops that can withstand those kinds of heats, that's less land to, okay, to grow food on. So, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, Diane's asked, will this talk be available on the ASAP website? It's being transmitted live on Facebook. So as soon as we are done with this, it will be available on Facebook as well. Uh, Neil, I mean, it's amazing how the times run out. Uh, yeah. So one final question from my side is, I mean, great we have all of this understanding, but as we see areas developing uh, and, you know, settlement, human settlement is, is a big uh, requirement also with your slide showing the influx from rural to urban areas with, with bigger development. Um, and I mean, the, the infrastructure in both the developed areas and the rural areas are, you know, chalk and cheese at the moment. Mm -hmm. so, so what is being done? To what extent does the engineering fraternity be called on to make an assessment of areas regarding the infrastructure and all of these issues prior to a development being approved? I mean, I know, for example, the archaeologists have to do a review uh, from an environmental perspective, from an archaeological perspective, to what extent does uh, engineer or the engineering uh, fraternity be called on to make that assessment as well? So I'm not going to doubt this, but here we go. If, if you want to establish a formal township, you have to get an A and a B certificate to certify to the developer and to the deeds office that creates the subdivision that you're able to provide services to that land. So the A is part one and then the B is part two saying, we can do it and we have done it. And then your development can go ahead. Otherwise your development will not be approved. But the problem we have is that the informal settlements grow faster than the planners and the, and the controllers of that land space. So, so you know, I always say that informal settlements are a result of, of failed planning. Uh, mm -hmm. And very agile people who can move faster than, than municipalities can. And now you've got a de facto development that doesn't have an A and a B certificate. You've now got to try and work with those people to provide the services. So they're two very different paradigms. Um, and that a lot of thought has been given now to, as to how, how to control that. Because the, the law actually protects land invasion, as you know. If you can be on that site for longer than a certain period of time, that, that place cannot be demolished. And there's this inhumanity aspect and the moral aspects as well in that. So, yeah. you know, you, you get outmaneuvered by a very agile check farmer, and there's a lot of them around who, you know, it's a business. They go into yes. this land, build a whole lot of shacks, rent them out for 600 grand a month, and they live big, and then they will defend that to the end. And now you come as the service provider because he says, that's not my job to provide the services. And, and right. That. So it's two different paradigms. Yeah, I wish yeah. it was so easy. I wish we could have A and B certificates for informal settlements. Yeah. Yes, I, I suppose that's where the problem comes in. Whenever there's something informal, like you know, in informal um, uh, shop, I mean, not uh, selling of produce, etc. Yes. It all it all happens in a space that's that's not controlled by the legal requirements that happens in a formal space. Yes. And so invariably, you know, these short circuits uh, happen and, uh, and, and also, um, you know, these, the, we are also perturbed by uh, cable theft and all go. of these things that are happening. I mean, even in the urban area, mm -hmm. um, our train systems are compromised with the rail infrastructure that goes astray. So, so basically, I mean, although you've just touched on sanitation and some water issues, uh, the engineers of our country is like, you know, the, the, the scaffold on which um, all of our livelihoods are dependent. And I am very pleased that at least we've had an opportunity to touch base with the likes of yourself. And I'm sure uh, we will um, engage with other members of the Engineering Academy 
uh, because uh, we have uh, so much, we, we, we want the same uh, justice for our future generations and livelihoods to be uh, promoted in an environment uh, that's um, con conducible for, you know, a, a life, a good life for all. Uh, whether it's in the urban development or the informal settlement or the rural areas. And so uh, we are very grateful that you could at least share your time with us, um, bring these uh, eloquent insights to our forebrain and our attention. And as one of the colleagues asked, you know, what can we do with respect to advocacy? So we should try to get these messages across in terms of... Uh, the issues that, that bug us and use whatever mechanisms we have to bring it to the attention of policymakers. I know that policymakers are aware of these challenges. Uh, and uh, so, for example, I know that uh, the uh, Treasury Department has their own researchers go out and scope out, you know, all these infrastructural uh, types of activities where we need dams and for, for the macro and micro environments. So we can all contribute towards, you know, putting our hands up and saying, you know, we need more attention to these areas. But currently in this country, um, when you look at the list of challenges, there are so many. And you've got to ask the question, like, do you need water, air or food to survive? It's like making those difficult choices of prioritizing, prioritizing which of our needs are more important on the day. But I like the way in which you used uh, the metaphor of the Cinderella aspect for sanitation. Uh, you raised the urgent uh, um, focus from basis of the challenges and you gave us a very clear and eloquent way to, to have a bird's eye view of the, the, the systemic uh, issues involved in this topic. So on behalf of all of us, uh, participants and the ASAF Secretariat, I wish to really thank you for a wonderful, wonderful journey into your world. For me, it's been uh, uh, an awesome experience to be able to join the dots a little bit more. You know, you listen to the radio and you see sound bites and you start swearing and saying all kinds of nasty things without really conceptualizing what the issues really are. And I think you did that for us today. You brought it uh, home. The message is very clear. And um, we hope to hear from you and your colleagues in the near future in terms of how our infrastructure from the likes of all engineers contribute to shaping our day-to-day -day lives. So there are many messages that are on the chats and so on. Thanking you for a very good presentation. I just want to echo those words once again. And um, good luck in your new home. And uh, please uh, get uh, the Itigueni municipality to clear out the E. coli levels and our beaches, because I think we all need a bit of a beach holiday. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Cheers Bye. from us all. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. -bye.